Uh, and with that, I want to bring up our, our partner, Peter Strauss. Uh, Peter is a colleague and a friend for many, many years, and he's been with our firm now for, I think, four years, Peter? If July will be four years. Four years, and our New York City office strangely just began to grow when Peter joined, and we now have five full-time attorneys, and a lot of that is due to Peter's experience and his ability to draw people in. He drew me in many years ago when I used to hear him. He's one of the founders of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. He's a member of the American College of Trust and Estates Council, and one of the most prestigious awards in New York State for attorneys is the Attorney Professionalism Award. It's given to one lawyer in all of New York out of 72,000 members of the New York State Bar Association, and Peter won that award in 2019. I give you Peter Strauss. And I must say, um, it's been a very exciting ride. I was with a big firm called Drinker Biddle, um, and they called me one in one day four years ago and said, you're too old, you can't practice anymore, goodbye. So I called Lou and said, remember the conversation we had 15 years ago? He said, I've been waiting by the phone. <laughs> and it's been a joy to be with a boutique firm and we're, we're unusual. I mean, you see today the talent that I have behind me. Um, we do everything from playing high net worth people of forty and fifty thousand dollars, and we do Medicaid applications. Million. I mean, you know, think about that. <laughs> so everybody's important, and everyone in this room is important. So since Lee started with the joke, let me follow in suit. Picture Lyndon Johnson in 1965 sitting around the signing desk for Medicare and Medicaid, particularly about Medicare, with his friends and supporters saying, no longer will senior citizens face the danger of impoverishment in later life now that they have Medicare. That's the joke. Nobody's laughing. We talked a little bit about home care costs before. Do you know what a private room in a Manhattan or Bronx or Brooklyn nursing home costs per day? Between $650 and $700 per day. And don't think you can beat that if you get a semi-private. It may go down $50 a day. Home care costs, a home care aid, $25 to $30 per hour for someone who may be sitting around watching TV most of the day. We are impoverishing middle-income Americans. Naomi may be able to afford health care. That was asked earlier. People who are poor get Medicaid automatically. But middle-income Americans are being devastated. And since 1965, nobody talked about this issue Hillary Clinton did a little bit, and she didn't win. And in the Build Better uh, Act, there is some proposal for some assistance. It's not great, but at least we're talking about it. So that's the background of the elder law side of our law firm. We help people survive the cost of later life if you're not lucky enough to get a disease that we will die from quickly. So that's, that's part of what I want to talk about today. But before I get to that, I want to talk about two sort of side issues. We already talked about the conflict of interest. But here we're doing, let's assume we're the advisors, we're, we're, we've formulated a plan for Naomi for the business and we've evaluated it and we've done the documents and she gets a stroke. Does she have a power of attorney? Does corporate governance have sufficient ways to implement that plan? This is what Teresa would be able to do, help with the corporate side. We've got to get their advanced directives in place. There has to be powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, living wills, governance opportunities, so we can implement this plan for the benefit of Naomi and Greg and the parent who was ill and the child who has a disability. Um, we talked a little bit about the conflicts. The other, I think, elephant in the room 
is the question of equity. Here you have four children, two of each marriage. One has a disability, one's going to get the business. How do you balance that out? So we're weaving in, you've heard a lot today about life insurance and different formulations and buyouts, et cetera. But that's another thing that as planners, we all have to think about. So I want to run through this so we leave time for questions. I'm going to walk over here so I can see the slides. I think we've talked about this. I think you all know what a power of attorney does. Um, we have a new statutory form in New York, went into effect June 13th. If you're, someone says to you, go do a quick power of attorney for me, I'm, I'm flying to Timbuktu, we're gonna do some traveling, things are a little bit better. Make sure that the form you have on your computer or the one you go down to the corner stationery store, if it still exists anymore, is the new form. It's all different and has to have two witnesses as opposed to just notarization. The gift writer always did, but now the gift writer has been incorporated into the body of the power of attorney form. All of this needs to be done. Healthcare proxy living will, we do a combined form. So these are the advanced directives. And by the way, we've been talking about Naomi, but Greg needs these as well. Okay. So let's now talk a little bit about the generation above and the generation below. Mavis is in failing health. Um, she doesn't have much money. How is she going to pay for long-term care? Well, um, ah, this is a little out of order. So let, let me take a minute on this, because I think this is, is an important part of background. If somebody becomes ill, are they still capable of executing a business plan, healthcare documents, powers of attorney? And the answer is you don't know till you delve into the facts, but capacity is not an on-off switch. If somebody's diagnosed with moderate Alzheimer's disease, technically the medical term is senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type. There are many causes of dementia, we now understand that about 70 to 75% of all dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease. She may or may not have capacity. Capacity is task specific. It used to be, if you were in a guardianship proceeding and somebody said, well, my dad has Alzheimer's disease, everybody assumed he lacked capacity, therefore you need a guardian. That's not true. Capacity is task specific. Let me give you an example. Um, I have some guidelines here that I've developed over the year, uh, how to evaluate it. And essentially, they, my, these guidelines come out of writings of the ABA and the APA, American Psychiatric Psychological Association. And, and a good example is, do you have capacity to sign a power of attorney? And these guidelines will tell us, yes, if there's a history if you understand you have a need, you're not able to manage your financial affairs, there's a relationship with the person that you choose, you may be able to do it. But now let's assume you add to that power of attorney the right of your agent to make gifts on your behalf. You've raised the bar of capacity. It may take more understanding when you've included higher and more complicated powers than when it was just someone who can help you manage your financial affairs. So this is something you need to think about when you're engaged in, in any kind of planning. Um, the, 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 the light is right in my eyes here. So these are the guidelines. I think you can look at them on your own if anyone's interested. I've done a couple of articles on this subject and we'd be happy to send it to you. It may even be up on our website. But let's get back to, um, okay, failure to plan. What are the consequences? Well, in the subject we're talking about today, you may not be able to implement this particular plan. But in general, if you don't have advanced directives, you may wind up with a court-appointed guardian and it, it may be me or Lou, and we're pretty busy people, or Karen. 
You don't want strangers mar uh, managing your life. Um, we're involved in a couple of very contested guardianships right now. We're doing we're, and seeing more and more need for guardianship proceedings. Two children fighting over where mother should live, who should be the guardian. They may wind up with a stranger managing their mother's life. Uh, we, I have another case, a new case. Two children were just removed because the court examiner decided that they made poor investments. And they're out. They have now a stranger as guardian. All right, we don't, we don't want this. We can avoid this. It is a defense to the appointment of a guardian that you have your advanced directives in place. And it's sad to say we're seeing more and more litigation going. So these are part of the um, consequences of not having the advanced directives, aside from the fact that you may become poor. So let's talk about um, how Naomi and Greg, and remember underlying all of this is Mavis is not, um, you know, it's not Naomi's mother, it's Greg's mother. So if she doesn't have enough money to support her, is she going to kick in? And again, they're not married. So what can we do to help pay for Mavis's costs? Well, private pay, just gave you the numbers. We may blow through Mavis's money fairly quickly. So now someone else has to step up to the plate. Long-term care insurance, well, it's a good idea for children to consider buying long-term care insurance for their parents. It's too, too late to get a policy on Mavis's life. Maybe they, if they'd done it 20 years ago. And also, as Lee pointed out, there are very few companies selling it now. Uh, Genworth has just sent out letter, letters to all of its policyholders in New York um, saying, you know, we have to offer you the option to surrender your policy. And if you do it, uh, and get a no cash back now, you'll have X dollars in a permanent fund for the rest of your life, but no more premiums. And they say in that letter, by the way, if you stay with your policy because you think it's worth having, you can anticipate 250% premium increases over the next five to six years. And by the way, we may not be able to pay claims at the time you go into claim. Yeah, it's public information, it's general. It used to be called GE Capital. Um, and other companies are facing it. So yes, explore life insurance with, with accelerated benefits options, some of the new hybrids. Lee and I could have a debate over whether they're the best approach because of the costs, but it's worth doing. All right, but finally, and what I'm gonna talk about now for a minute the last point, supplemental needs trust for Mavis, is the same thing I will talk to you about for the Joshua, the child, who's on the autism spectrum. This is a beautiful device. Greg can set up a trust for his mother, Mavis. He is the grantor, he funds it, he can create it now, or perhaps in his will, but obviously he should be creating it now because Mavis is, he, you know, he's not going to survive Mavis, so his will doesn't mean anything in, in terms of her benefits. So he creates this trust, he funds it, it will exist if he dies, if he becomes incapacitated, it will support Mavis, pay for her supplemental needs, but allow her to obtain Medicaid benefits, which in New York for home care are fairly generous. Mavis is, is not eligible for Medicaid now, but she could create her own trust called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust to protect her assets. And if she does it before a new law, which goes into effect, and I'll come to that in a minute, there would be no waiting period. There is a waiting period, as you all know, for persons who apply for nursing home benefits. If you give assets away within five years, the state will look back, pull those assets back in, and a period of ineligibility will begin at the time you go to the nursing home. And you are otherwise eligible. In other words, if you have given away all your assets, but the gifts that you gave away within five years will start a penalty period at the time you apply for Medicaid. New York never had a waiting period 
for community Medicaid, home care benefits. As a result of New York City's budget problems and the pandemic, the legislature at Governor Cuomo's urging passed a new waiting period law, a transfer of asset penalty law that was supposed to have gone into effect uh, October 1st, 2020. It's been deferred. The latest official date was April 1st, 2022. And now we're not even sure it will be implemented then because so long as the federal health emergency exists uh, states cannot pass restrictive Medicaid legislation, so they can't implement that law. But there will be a two and a half year waiting period for Medicaid eligibility for home care benefits if you give away your money into a trust, to your children, or whatever. So th that's, that's an issue. So many of our clients are expediting their Medicaid applications now before this new law goes into effect. But we, we need to deal with Mavis's assets because she's over eligible. She's only allowed to have $15,900 in this year. It'll go up a little bit January 1st. Retirement funds in payout status are not countable, but we have to protect that income. And your primary residence is also an exempt resource. If it's under a certain equity value, which changes every year, which I think this year is 900 and 903 or is it 804? What is it? 904. 904,000. Peter, we have about five minutes left. A equity value. So we deal with Mavis's assets under current law, get her Medicaid eligible. Greg can create a supplemental needs trust for her. The question of whether Naomi would kick in is a whole other issue. For Jason, the son, same thing. Naomi sets up a trust for her children under her new trusts that we're going to be creating. We, we're really encouraging clients to plan that the ultimate uh, distribution of their estates through trusts rather than wills because of delays in probate court, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in her testamentary documents, she will create a supplemental needs trust for her son. That trustee has broad powers to take care of Jason You'd want to carefully draft that trust so it is not considered to be available to Jason. In other words, treat it as his asset in terms of his Medicaid or SSI eligibility. That can be done. Be careful. It can't be a, a support trust. It has to be totally discretionary. If, if you use the typical tax standards, trustee can expend funds for Jason for health support, maintenance, and welfare. That makes it a support trust, and therefore it would be counted as his asset for Medicaid eligibility purposes and follow up his benefits. So there's a balance here that has to be accomplished. So well, what are we looking at here? And then I'd rather stop and let people ask questions. Make sure that Naomi's plan can be implemented take care of uh, Mavis's needs, and take care of the needs of the lower generation. Now, the equity question is also on the table. You know, you've got this big business. Uh, Greg's son is going to be the successor to Naomi's business. They're not married. How do you balance the needs of four children, one of whom has disabilities? Well, in a couple of client cases, I have deferred that decision so that the trust protector or some kind of a trust advisory committee can say that determination could be made at the time Naomi dies and the amount of the distribution could either be modified, funded in part if, for, if there's excess for Jason through life insurance, but give the trustee or the trust protector the opportunity to have some flexibility when the facts are known 10, 15, 20 years from now. So all this comes together. It's a part of the overall subjects of today, but it's something that cannot be neglected. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.